I was a pastor at the time when the, the topic of the book occurred to me. I was very struck by the difference in the way that I thought and my generation thought compared to the younger generation. That would have been, at the time, young people at the age of about 30. Now it would be anybody under the age of 45, given the time that has elapsed. Uh, to quote Bob Dylan, that I think is one of Humza's uh, favorites, the times, they are clearly uh, changing. But to disagree with Bob Dylan, I would say this, sometimes you do need a weatherman to know which way the wind blows. And I was struck that even as I looked at the dramatic changes that were taking place in the culture around me, uh, I was unable to find a book or an article that helped me understand why such dramatic things were taking place so rapidly. We all know that cultures change over time. That's inevitable, it seems. But the speed at which American culture in particular and Western culture in general has changed on the issue of things like sexuality and gender has been so fast over the last 10 years that it struck me there had to be peculiar forces at play to bring this about. That what we were witnessing as something that was happening before our eyes, that surface had to lie on something much deeper and much more long-standing. It rests upon what I would call an anthropological crisis. We are very familiar if you've been looking at the news, and I'm sure living in Berkeley and its environments, you're far more familiar than I am with the fact that the question, what is a woman, has caused an awful lot of confusion over the last couple of years on both sides of the Atlantic. That a question that seemed self-evident to me growing up has become something that even the most intelligent and powerful people in our culture seem unable to answer. I would suggest that the problem with the question, what is a woman, rests upon a problem with a deeper question, and the deeper question is, what does it mean to be human? Now, I'm a, a Christian. The vast majority of you here are Muslims. There are, I would suggest, uh, serious, deep, insurmountable theological differences between my religion and yours. But I would suggest also that we have an interest in answering that question because whatever our vision of heaven and the afterlife might be, we find ourselves at this particular cultural moment with a lot of interests in common that connect to that question of what does it mean to be a human being. We have a common interest in the protection of children. We have a common interest in the nature of education. We have a common interest in parental rights. We have a common interest in strong families. We have a common interest in safe streets. In the kingdom of this earth, in this earthly city, to use Augustinian language, I think we find ourselves with a lot of common interests and concerns. And therefore, I think we have a common interest and concern in understanding why the times are changing and how they have changed. And to give you the sort of two-minute version of my book, my thinking is this, that we live in an age unprecedented for what I call its psychologization of what it means to be a human being. What do I mean by that? We live in an age where we have given our feelings, our inner feelings and authority they have never had before. It is not that human beings have suddenly started to experience emotions. I'm very unfamiliar with the Quran, but at the heart of uh, the Hebrew Bible, at the heart of the Christian Bible, lies the book of Psalms. And the book of Psalms is replete with the psalmist emoting speaking about, reflecting upon his emotions. He has an inner space. 
What is interesting about the psalmist is this. He always brings his emotions under the authority of God, the covenant God of Israel. His emotions are one thing, but his task as a faithful member of the covenant is to bring those emotions into line with the history and the will of God. We live in a world now where we have authorized our feelings to the point that they are the ultimate authority. The most dramatic example of that, I think, is a transgender moment, where if you feel you are a woman, even if you can't define what that is, yet that is what you are. Feelings have been authorized. Secondly, we live in an era where human nature has been annihilated as a moral concept. We still, I think, believe that human beings share a biological commonality. Human beings reproduce with other human beings. We do not reproduce with other species. But beyond that bare minimal biological essence, we ascribe no moral significance to being a human being at all. Being a human being does not bring with it a moral framework to which we must conform in order to flourish. Being a human being means we are autonomous agents who find our identity, our selfhood, our flourishing in acting in accordance with our will, regardless of and in defiance of any external authority. Thirdly, we live in an era where human beings have been sexualized. If there is anything that binds us together as human beings, it's this. It's that we have sexual desires. That is the modern myth, and those sexual desires define who we are. And that is a profoundly pervasive concept. Uh, If you use the language of lesbian or gay or bisexual to describe your identity, then you are authorizing your sexual desires to have an authority that they have not historically had. Before, Again, I cannot comment on the Quran, but certainly in the Bible, sex is something you do, it is not something you are. Some sexual activities are legitimate, some are illegitimate. Nothing to do with the intention or the fulfillment that is found within them, and everything to do with the will of God that specifies how human beings are to behave. And interesting enough, if you describe yourself as straight you fall into that same category as well. You define yourself relative to your sexual desires in a way that I think is historically unprecedented. We also live in a world where technology has enabled all of this. Again, we will probably explore this more in the discussion, but think about it. Think about how technology shapes how we think about what it means to be a human being. If you read my book or if you read uh, my books, there's no need to read them because I've told you what they say now. You don't have to read them at all. But one of the things I miss when I deal with the trans issue is this. The trans issue politically is linked to the LGBTQ. Philosophically, it's actually part of transhumanism. It is a specific branch of the idea that technology can enable us to transcend what it means to be human. I completely missed that in the books, and yet it seems to me a key component. What is technology enabling us to do in a way unprecedented in human history? I would put it this way. It is enabling us to separate the who we are from the what we are as never before. Human beings, we are unique as creatures on the face of the planet in that there is always a distinction between who we are and what we are. I know some of you a little bit, Many of you I don't know at all. I know what you are, you're all human beings, I can see that. But that tells me virtually nothing worthwhile about you whatsoever. Because who you are is far more important. If we talk afterwards and I ask you about yourself, you don't tell me your blood group, you don't tell me your genome, you tell me the things you do, the decisions you've made, the people you have relationships with the things that you have freely engaged in. Those are the most important things about you. And that's one of the wondrous things about being a human being. 
We are free and intentional creatures. If you put a chicken in the presence of a fox, you've seen every chicken in the presence of every fox. Fox kills the chicken. There's only one way that story ends. If I put a chicken in your presence, I don't know, maybe some of you will wring its neck, maybe some of you will release it into the wild, maybe some of you will keep it as a pet. I don't know, because your relationship is a free one. Well, historically, who we are is more important than what we are, and yet the what has exerted some control over the who. We still are a what that sets limits to who we can be. I could never be an NBA player. Five foot 11, not Allen Iverson, not going to make it. The what I am shapes who I am. Technology leads us to imagine that actually our freedom can be absolute. We can completely transcend ourselves. There is no external authority anywhere that can corral us. All of this is to say we live at a very difficult and challenging time. I was very surprised when my book uh, was picked up in the Jewish community uh, and then in the Latter-day Saints. I nearly fell off my chair in my office at Grove City College when uh, Zaytuna College contacted me. I said, wow, I I never thought I'd break into the Muslim market, so to speak. Uh, uh, But then it struck me that anyone who actually cares about external authority, anybody who actually cares about human society as human society, wherever they're coming from, religiously or philosophically, is going to feel the same kind of pressures and have the same sort of questions. That's what I hope our discussion will be exploring this evening. Thank you for listening so patiently. Thank mm-hmm. you.